This is William Henry filling in for Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. Welcome, everyone. It's been described as bedlam in Scotland with the advent of the Da Vinci Code. Muslim Chapel near Edinburgh has suddenly been thrust into, into the global limelight. Many are excited about the possibility that secret artifacts of the mysterious Knights Templar hidden in the crypt under Roslyn Chapel may soon be revealed. The media brainwashing machine put Roslyn through another spin cycle again recently when a father and son team claimed to have unraveled the coded piece of music hidden in the carvings of the temple. As always, there is far, far more to Roslyn Chapel and Templar mysteries, we believe. Perhaps claims like these only serve to cloud the real issues and the real secrets of the Templars. And in order to get to the core of the mysteries of the Templars, it's important to have a rock-solid foundation of knowledge upon which to climb. Our guest today, Dr. Karen Rawls, is an Oxford-based author, medieval historian, and religious studies scholar. She's widely recognized for her work on that rock-solid Templar foundation. The stones of this foundation we know are very heavy to lift, and Karen's been doing some very heavy lifting. She obtained her Ph.D. from the University of Edinburgh and was postdoctoral fellow at Edinburgh University before continuing with specialist medieval research in Oxford. Dr. Rawls is a member of the British Association for the Study of Religion, the American Academy of Religion, the Oxford University Religious Studies Society, and is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Many listeners have likely seen Karen on numerous TV documentaries for the History Channel, Discovery, and National Geographic Agency, excuse me, the National Geographic Channel. Her website is KarenRawls.com. She is here to talk about her new book, The Knight Templar Encyclopedia. Karen, welcome to Dreamland. Well, thank you, William. Very nice and honored to be on the program. And, well, of course, your listeners are often very attuned to many of these things already, so it should be a very interesting hour. Absolutely, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. You and I have corresponded for years. It's nice to finally hear your voice. <laughs> and yours, too, yes. So, first question, Karen, how does an American girl, an American woman, find herself at Oxford <laughs> and at Roslyn, with a, with a uh, front row seat to one of the greatest mysteries of perhaps the last couple thousand years or so. Well, every every one of us, of course, as you know, is on a quest. And I think, uh, again, so much of what um, your introduction talked about, um, the subject of the mysteries and quests and relics and things like that. Um, ironically, in my own case, I was just very interested in not only doing some family research involving ancestors in the British Isles, but also in medieval history. So naturally, I think at some point for me, I wanted to actually go to the sites and the archives, which originally were here, and I um, wasn't you know, sure how long I would stay on. But the more I got into it and the more depth that you know, the research revealed many more years later, <laughs> and I'm wow. still here. But um, I, I am, in a sense, um, an ambassador both ways. I mean, it's, it's been very fascinating. To, to be here as an American as well. Um, yes, it has been. But again, a lot of these issues about the medieval period, um, of course, our country started um, in the 18th century, but a lot of the, the history, um, I know like some movies like National Treasure and things like that, people like to try to make a connection with the medieval time because there is something about the Middle Ages that has a, a you know, it seems they have a mystical aura about it anyway. <laughs> and I think a lot of that is due to, as you said in your intro there, you know, Hollywood films and novels and things like The Da Vinci Code has actually been a very powerful phenomenon um, beyond, far beyond just a novel. And it has indeed started a whole new cycle of questioning for, for everyone. Um, even scholars <laughs> are finding themselves um, in a very interesting situation. So, I think from all ends of the spectrum, all of us are on a quest. And as an academic, I have been on a quest as well. Um, it is, I, it, I ended up over here um, in Britain, but at the same time, um, I can go to the sites and the archives more easily here and then come back. To, I come to America several times a year. So mm -hmm. it is very fascinating, but there's so much to it. And the more you learn, the more you know there is yet to learn. Yeah, and one of the things I appreciate about your work so much, Karen, is it, when you look at the, 
the, the other books that you've published, on uh, whether it be on the supernatural aspects of Celtic music or the Holy Grail mm. and your quest mm-hmm. for the Celtic key, which I hope to talk with you about for a moment later, you have, you're not only an ambassador from the United States living in Britain or the U.K., but you're also an ambassador from the wild side, if you will. You're a wild child who's also got a Ph.D. <laughs> and has to oh, operate as a tell- historian <laughs> and someone with an open mind, which is so rare among, it seems, among scholars. Talk about how you built that bridge well, for a moment. Well, it is, it is very interesting. It, uh, I, I would have to say the overall climate in that sense in academia is much better now than it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. Things are changing. Um, on the other hand, in the alternative community, there are some some who, you know, don't have as open of a mind as what one might originally think. So, I mean, there are many different factions and groups within both areas. Um, it is interesting to go between the two. <laughs> it can get it can get a bit of a, a tight wire act, as they say. Um, it can be difficult sometimes, you know. But um, by and large, I would say, um, given the internet and the digitalization of so many archives now and libraries, you can find so much more online that everyone can can do research and ask questions and and do their quest. And that includes academics. You know, no one is exempt from from further learning and <laughs> exploration. So, in a sense, we all um, can do that. And yes, of course, academics often do like to um, protect their turf, as it were. But um, I think, in, especially in medieval history, um, there are so many dimensions to each area of study that um, there's no way that one could ever have a handle on any one given part. And one of the biggest medieval Congress conferences of all in academia is in America. It's in Michigan every year, so I think that's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it's like it's very fascinating. I mean, you can you can study this anywhere, but um, I, I'm sort of a hands-on person. I actually like to go to the sites, but um, again, I I think a lot of it is about, you know, it's not just about you know studying words on paper or in dusty archives or libraries, you know, and and of course many you know, older locations, the carvings, it, it all sounds very fascinating. But the truth is we are now, even in photography and things like that, with the increased technology and digitalization, there are now more information and details emerging about some of these subjects, and in particular, tonight's Templar. So mm-hmm. I think, in a sense, the, the Templar research and information about them is really only getting off to a real good start in more recent years, partly and, because and, of more information. Mm-hmm. And one of the points that you make that I think is so important is that one reason we want to study the history of the Templars is not just because it takes us into such exciting domains as the study of the Gnostics or Solomon's Temple or or other esoteric type of subjects, but you also believe that studying the history of the Templars or, or history in general can help help us propel into the future. Talk about that aspect of your quest. Mm. Well, I think any any medieval historian would say, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the, the traditional topics that we think of when you say Middle Ages, most people think of King Arthur, the Grail, um, again, Indiana Jones searching for something. I mean, we have certain images, and one of those is of the Crusader Knight Templar with the, the white mantle with the red cross symbol, you know, the trademark images, and, and, you know, I almost could say stereotypes in a sense that we have about these subjects. However, sometimes the nitty-gritty reality, and especially like in the case of the daily life of the Knight Templar, which was actually a lot different than sometimes what we're, you know, generally led to believe or think about, um, because a lot of Templars were not necessarily a full knight of the order. Now, maybe 10% were a smaller percentage, but, you know, by by and large, three-quarters of the order were not full knight Templars, you know, the, the classic warrior image we have. They, were, they did work in um, agricultural things. They did trade things. They did all kinds of business activities as well and a lot of variety there. And so, again, now more details are emerging about the practical daily life of not just the Templars but all these other subjects. Some of the Grail romances now we're having more information about, you know, more of the Arthurian characters in those stories. So again, a lot of a lot of this is just now starting to come to the fore in a very vibrant way that it hasn't beforehand. So it is an exciting time. 
The Templars possessed and became sworn guardians of quote-unquote ancient knowledge. Do you think this alone accounts for the rise in Templarism, or is it something else that's driving this? It's the power pack behind this. Well, you mean the primary power behind these Templars? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I don't think they had only one particular aspect of power. I mean, it depends on how you define power. That would be my first question there. Um, mm -hmm. But assuming that you mean, like, earthly power or wealth or mm -hmm. land, of course, yes, the Templars were, in, in very a very real sense, the first um, concept in our Western civilization and history, and Europe especially, of a, of a type of multinational corporation. They were, in a sense, the first medieval example of that. Um, they had their headquarters in the, in the east, in the Holy Land, and then they had many, many um, localized regional areas in, in England, Portugal, Spain, France, all the way to Eastern Europe even. And those, those sections were called commanderies. And that was, of course, they had a, a, master, a local master of the Templars in charge of that area, kind of in our, our conception would perhaps would be the governor of a state, <laughs> as opposed to the president of the nation, you know, that, that kind of a structure. And they had a real hierarchical structure, of course, as did most of the, you know, religious orders. Um, but the Templars were not just an ordinary religious order in terms of when you say monk, um, you think of a, a praying monk in a monastery. Um, of course, the Templars were very devout, but but the found, one of the key founders and sponsors was a very powerful, influential Cistercian abbot by the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. Mm -hmm. And this, this whole area that he was from is in what we call Champagne area today of France. And um, at that time, it was called Old Burgundy, where Burgundy wine comes from. <laughs> and um, there's the city of Troy, which is very key in, in, in a sense in the early Templars. Um, the first nine knights, um, the legendary nine knights who went to um, the Holy Land initially in the early 12th century, were from uh, this area of Troy. So in a sense, all roads lead to Troy um, <laughs> in many different ways. <laughs> um, if you really want to start dissecting the beginnings of the order, which in my opinion are far more enigmatic than the end. Um, that's the side con of mine. But I, I do think that, um, that as far as power... Um, many questions remain about, of course, people say, what did the Templars find? What were they digging for? Were they digging? Um, of course, um, as a scholar, I would have to say we, we have no documentation. Um, I might add in the next breath, and we may never have documentation. And part of the reason for that is the situation, what happened with the Templar archives. And there were archives. It's not that they never kept records. They did, as many organizations did then, but they had a, a situation <laughs> um, due to, you know, not only a number of great victories in the Crusades, which we've all heard about, but, of course, after the terrible um, final defeat, you might say, for Christendom at, at the Fall of Acre, it's a terrible battle, the Crusades in 1291, and after that point, um, in many ways, the Templars kind of lost their reason for existence you know, politically speaking, among the monarchs of, of Europe. And some of the people, too, they gradually, as the years went on, it was like, well, the Templars, you know, we, we lost the Holy Land. And so it kind of, you know, one thing led to the, another. And then finally, um, after a series of battles in the Crusades, I won't get into here, but finally there, there was a situation by 1571 on the island of Cyprus, which is one of the last places the Templar archives were known to be, um, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks captured Cyprus, and at that point, not only some of the medieval Templar archives were destroyed or disappeared, but so did the Hospitallers, their rival order. Hmm. So, Karen, let's take a break point, for a moment, and when we come back, let's get into some more detail about some of these true secrets of the Templars and what might have been found in those archives or what remains to be discovered. Okay. All right. This is... This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. Well, there's something new in the wind. The first annual Dreamland Festival is going to take place in Nashville, June the 27th through the 29th. Right now, tickets are discounted at $250 each with an additional $25 off for subscribers. That gets you Whitley Strieber and Strieber, William Henry, 
Linda Moulton Howe and Jim Mars and each other. All of us will be making cutting-edge presentations, plus there'll be a chance to have a special meditation with me. It's going to be a very exciting time for all of us. Don't miss what we believe will become an annual event. This extraordinary audience getting together and sharing your experiences with us in a state of ongoing wonder at Nashville this summer. To sign up, go to the unknowncountry.com store, click on the latest tab, and it'll be the first item in the list. Subscribers, use your coupon to save an additional $25. And subscribers, that coupon code is DF1. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Dr. Karen Rawls. Karen, the Order of the Temple was founded in 1118 with the initial aim of protecting pilgrims going to and from Jerusalem, but many believe that these Templars were in all probability also searching for hidden treasures underneath the long-destroyed Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. How much of that is actual fact? I mean, you're saying that <laughs> there, there likely is not documentation that says exactly what happened, but yet it's widely assumed to have happened. What is your, what are your... Well, basically, here's the situation from the actual um, documented evidence, which is always nice to start with. <laughs> um, what we do know is that the conflicting report, a beginning of the order, we have several key accounts. One of them is by William of Tyre, who's a key chronicler then, and there were five or six others, but that none of them agree exactly on what was happening at, with the first nine nights. They originally went there in 11... Um, it was 1119 by the medieval calendar now, but to the, the Temple Mount area, and King Baldwin gave them what we might call today five-star accommodation um, on the southeastern platform area of the Temple Mount, and that is where they were allowed to you know, live and have their accommodation because they didn't have a lot of money at the, at the beginning. And as underneath this area, as is very widely known today, of course, archaeologists in the area, there, are, there were aqueducts and water. And so, you know, again, the, the, the so-called stables of Solomon area underneath that area is where the temple, the Templars did keep their horses. It's a huge area. Um, they could keep up to 2,000 horses in there. So wow. it, it was a very, there was a, a very, it's a very huge area. And, um, again, there's a lot of questions about um, certain excavations and expeditions later. But as far as the early 12th century period, um, we just don't honestly have documentation. Now, when you don't have actual archival evidence, <laughs> it, it's real hard to, to say for sure, William. <laughs> so, again, there are questions. Some people say, well, maybe they, they were looking for something. Okay, well, we don't know what they were doing um, for sure, but we do know that, that there is the evidence for their guarding pilgrims full-time is certainly scanty. It, it's not non-existent. They, they desperately needed to guard the pilgrims, because there were so many raids by Saracens for pilgrims going into the Jerusalem area, that there certainly was a definite need. So that, that they started out with that um, ostensible purpose at the beginning. But um, that was one thing. But we, we also do not have enough evidence that they were digging either. <laughs> I mean, the evidence is scanty on both sides. So again, um, because of the situation with archaeology there, even today, there are many um, various groups and many opinions about that area. So I, it may never come to light. We may never know. And so I think, in a sense, we have, to, we have to leave that open. We just don't really know for sure. One of my pet peeves when watching documentaries about the Templars and their, their <laughs> well, quest to, mm. to uncover the secrets of the Temple, and even the documentaries about uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene during that period, is the hokey way that they portray these figures, especially Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They emphasize their poverty, and basically, oh, mm. I don't think of them as simple people. Rather, I think of them as operating in temple workshops, doing research, mm -hmm. and the main place that almost is never talked about in terms of a, an actual location where Jesus and Mary Magdalene might have operated, so to speak, is the Temple of Solomon. And invariably, you never see the Temple of Solomon portrayed, at least in mainstream media, like History Channel, Discovery, or these others, 
with mm. its 10-story tower or porch attached. And that, to me, is such a key point of this whole uh, investigation into the Templars and to Roslyn, because as you note in the Knights Templar Encyclopedia, with Roslyn Chapel is unfinished. Plans called for a tower to be erected in the center of the chapel, going how high into the sky. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and what was the function of the temple? If the Templars were looking for the secrets of Solomon's temple, what would be your best guess, or maybe another way we can say this is, what can we for sure rule out that they were not looking for? The Ark of the Covenant? The Holy Grail? Ooh, that's a tough one. I, I don't know, actually, but how to answer that. There's so many different dimensions to that question. First mm-hmm. of all, a lot of scholars, archaeologists, will say that you know the temple has never exactly been found. They don't know exactly where they, and, and the, the scriptures don't exactly describe it. You know, so the place they're about to launch World War Three over, they're, that the Jews and Muslims <laughs> yeah. and Christians call sacred, might not even be the place after all. Well, there's a lot of debate. Oh, yes, it's raging right by the hour, it would seem. Indeed. And I think um, as far as Roslyn Chapel, um, again, the, the Glasgow Cathedral design is very, very similar to um, some of the layout of Roslyn because what exists there today, technically speaking, is the lady, what was intended to be the Lady Chapel. So what, what we walk into today, which is called the Collegiate Chapel of St. Matthew, by the way, that's the official mm-hmm. name, <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, Roslyn Chapel is, is on the hill, but it was not the original um, St. Sinclair Family Chapel, which was in the castle. A lot of people think that, that it was Roslyn Chapel, but it wasn't. But the, the chapel today there, um, of course, is technically incomplete, and as you say, it was intended to be a much larger cathedral building, and they have found the... Um, uh, foundation outline for that, but again, there's a we we don't have it's it's, it's interesting another yet another enigma perhaps for another time to discuss this, but there are again no records of the original um, plans for Roslyn. We don't have the founders um, Sir William St Clair's record um, diary maps that type of thing are not there. They ostensibly um, disappeared in a fire. And so we don't know. <laughs> Again, it, it's um, enigmatic, and I think, you know, that's it's so long ago now, of course, in our early 21st century, our new millennium. The question, of course, is what, why are so many people drawn to Roswell? Well, mainly people will say it's the carvings. They are extraordinary. And mm-hmm. if you've been there, you'll probably agree that you walk in, and it, it strikes you immediately that everyone – Things, my goodness, I expected this huge Gothic cathedral, and it's, it's rather small. It's actually a physically small chapel walking into it, but it is absolutely beyond extraordinary what is actually in each space. Every, every carving on every wall and ceiling and floor, it is entirely of stone, and it was the first um, stone barrel roof in all of Scotland. You know, it's the first building that had a whole roof of stone as well. And, of course, on the outside of the chapel, there are carvings, even up on the roof. It's extraordinary. There's green man carvings on the roof. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, yes, Edinburgh, has has to be, Edinburgh has to be one of my all-time favorite places I've, uh, places I've ever it is, visited. It is it's pure magic. City with a and, very interesting history. Mm. Now, did you live there for a time, Karen? I did, indeed, of 11 years. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> Quite a long time. And, of course, Edinburgh is not seen in a vacuum. It's, it's, it's the landscape around it, which, um, back to Roslyn, um, it's a very key point. It's not just the chapel. It is part of what I call a tripartite um, reality there. It's, it's the chapel, the castle, and the glen. And it's the glen area around it that um, one could possibly argue that is why the chapel was built, where it was built. Um, again, the details that take us too long to digress into that. Um, but I would say, um, regarding the Knight Templar, Roslyn itself was not built by the Knight Templar. But right. very close to Roslyn is the village of Temple, which in medieval times um, it was called Ballon Traddock, which um, was the actual Scottish headquarters of the medieval Scottish Knight Templar. So it wasn't far away, but I just want to clarify, it's, it wasn't, it's not Roslyn, was not built by the Templars. It was a Sinclair and Sir Gilbert Hay and their colleagues and their guilds build it. And the village of Roslyn was built for the stonemasons. It was built for that purpose. <laughs> um, although it's a very old place, um, and 
you know, the actual village as we know it, um, was for, for the purpose of building this extraordinary building. So, again, it has so many carvings from many traditions, and in a sense, does represent a kind of universal wisdom. Um, of course, it's a Christian building. Um, however, there's no crucifix there. Um, many have noticed that. There are um, a fair amount of Old Testament references in the Apocrypha, um, the books that were technically, so to call, left out of the Bible canon. Um, there's stories and, and references to that and the carvings of Rosalind. We also have some Rosicrucian analogies in some of the um, fixtures and things like that. And, and But it, it is the green man that many people um, relate to today as well. Of course, the environmental concerns we have in our co contemporary times. But it's extraordinary that this building was built right on the cusp of the High Middle Ages and the Renaissance, 1450. <clears throat> and that was when Gutenberg did his first printing, and <laughs> his printing press came. So it was a very powerful time, 1450. It was like cosmically and, and practically this time frame, 1450, was really an interesting time to build this building. And um, some have argued that um, Sir William Sinclair and his colleagues um, deliberately build it from that year, you know, on. So, I mean, again, it does serve today as a type of modern-day Mecca for a number of reasons. Um, it's very special to worldwide Freemasons. We do see a number of special connections there, in particular relating to the Royal Arch. Um, but there are many, many comments and um, so many things we could talk about regarding Roslyn, but it is a very special place indeed. But it wasn't actually built by the Templars. Um, that's True. But um, as far as who built it, the guilds, we aren't sure exactly where all they were from. France is a good bet, of course, but there was some Flemish input in other, other areas of Europe that, that were involved in it. So it is, in that sense, it's a continuing enigma, <laughs> like everything you've mentioned and I'm trying to answer. But, um, again, we have, we have to have an open mind. I mean, we, we, you know, as scholars, we tend to seem like killjoys who come in and rain in everybody's parade and say, oh, there's no evidence yet. But, you know, the truth is there is a lot of evidence about the Templars that has come to light. Um, a lot of it has yet to be translated. I was called fairly recently on some new documents that have just been found in Spain. 12th century Templar, you know, records of, you know, starting their farming and accounting records. But, you know, sometimes details can, can reveal something. But we'll see what, what unfolds. But, again, it's not like there aren't records out there about these things. A lot of the issue is right back to, again, something not frighteningly glamorous like treasure hunts. But it's the, arch it's the way information is archived in libraries. Now, mm -hmm. You can have a document, but the question is, what category does it file under? And that is what is really changing now because of the digitization. And so information that before was called one thing, say, in Victorian times, now it's under another category. So researchers are finding things that, that have been there all these years, but they just weren't, you know, classified. So, you know, I don't want to get into all of that, but it is a, a fact of our daily life as researchers that that is the kind of dilemma that you see quite a bit. And, of course, translations of different languages. Sometimes somebody mistranslates something, and it, it forever affects something for many, many years to come. <laughs> so, you know, our job is to go through and sift through what is there. And sometimes, of course, truth is stranger than fiction. We, we uncover something we didn't expect. But then again, we also find that some, certain things there just isn't any evidence for, at least not yet. Um, and I say yet because in any field, like archaeology or history, we always have to realize that at any point, new information can emerge or surface. And the question as to where some of that information is, is anyone guess? <laughs> it's a mystery. Karen, when we get back from the break, I'd like to talk with you about the Templar and their beliefs and philosophy. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Dr. Karen Rawls. Karen, one of the uh, things I picked up in your book, the Knights Templar Encyclopedia, is that one of the key mottos of the Knights Templar was carpe diem, seize the day. Talk about yeah. that in relation to their beliefs and their philosophy. Well, I guess I should start with the main symbol. Of course, everyone likes to ask, why do the Templars have white mantles with red crosses? That's an obvious mm -hmm. question. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, the reason... The first nine knights, I want to go right back to the, you know, the, the very, be, you know, beginning of the order, as you say, the first nine, what were they looking for and that. 
first of all, they would never have had their white mantles at that point. Mm-hmm. And every, a lot of people are surprised to hear that because they think at the very beginning the Templars would have, would have been like, the answer is they would have been in ordinary dress, you know, just um, because the order at that point was not officially founded yet. And perhaps that's why there's not a lot of documentation because mm-hmm. until 11, you know, until they came back to Europe from the Holy Land with whatever, <laughs> if they found something, they brought it back. Perhaps if they didn't, I don't know. But the point is the fall of 1127, when they came back, they, the fledgling the fledgling group of tiny, frankly, a tiny group of only nine men, suddenly in a year with, with the help of a very powerful, influential abbot, Bernard of Clairvaux, who's extraordinary by many, many accounts. He was just an amazing person with so much energy. <laughs> um, it's, it's an near anorexic living. I mean, it's just incredible what he achieved. And he lobbied for them at the very key Council of Troy. So from 1129 onwards, the official order of the temple existed with a new rule. Before that period, they were living by the Augustinian rule of the church. And then the Benedictine and especially the Cistercian input from Bernard came in by 1129. So from that point on, after they returned, they were officially an official order of the church, you might say. So from then on, the documentation does become more available. They suddenly, after that, had this amazing meteoric rise to power, and they got lots of money and land and donations and um, jewels, all kinds of things from, from all the monarchs and nobles, and everyone wanted to help this this new order. And, of course, in time, as their wealth grew, as their power grew, as their status grew, um, the envy grew of their rivals. And this this is a classic thing. It doesn't have to be just in the Middle Ages. (laughs) Um, Human nature taking over. Um, It just, it gradually became a situation where the king, King Philippe IV and Philip the Fair, and, of course, the Pope at the time, Clement V, um, gradually, um, many believe, conspired together um, to bring down this powerful order, which, in a sense, in their each of their views, for a different reason, had become basically a law unto itself. Even though they were responsible only to the Pope, they still were so wealthy that they were viewed as a threat. So, of course, the classic Friday the 13th, 1307, um, we have this sudden dawn arrest of this huge, wealthy, powerful organization. And at the time, it was unbelievable. No one could possibly believe this would happen. Today, it was like we would get up and, you know, you go, get up, you have your coffee, you walk down to the corner shop, get your newspaper, you think, oh, my God, it's like every executive of every company has been rounded up. <laughs> not everyone would protest now, probably, but yeah, not um, a bad in idea. the Middle Ages, it, yeah. <laughs> but it was just like unheard of. So it was this very sudden thing. And, of course, during the course of the trial, and it, I want to mention this was not one event. It was a series of very draconian, um, at, at best, really, um, difficult inquisitional trials, plural, trials, over five years. And the Templars, of course, experienced a lot of torture in certain areas, especially France, some of the other countries not so much in, at, at all, and the fate varied country by country, which I go into in a lot of detail in the book, what happened in each country. But the point is, by 1312, the order was suppressed officially by a papal bull. And at that, from that point on, to get you back to your question about relics and what did they find in the archives, at that point, all of the assets of the order were, were officially transferred to their rival, the main rival order at the time, was the hospitalers the Order of St. John. And so from that point on, um, some countries it took a bit longer to, you know, legally work it all out, but eventually the assets were um, turned over to the hospitalers. So we do know that from, you know, around 13, 14 or so, from the time the last Grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, um, very heroically went to his death, at that point onwards, the official end of the order was no more. And the memory and the mythos began. (laughs) And ever since then, it's been very fascinating. And, of course, this year, 2007, is 700 years later from 1307. So we we are today, to get to your point about Carpe Diem, Seize the Day was one of the major mottos of the Templars. And that basically is like medieval speak for go for it. 
really? go for it. Rock go on, for yeah. It. Right, and then the Templars, of course, on the battlefield, even their their own enemies, Saladin and the Saracens records, do say that they were extremely courageous, you know, even willing to be beheaded rather than convert. So they were indeed very much um, known to be very devout and very, very steadfast. So mm-hmm. in, in terms of, mo- of the, the motto, the main motto was not for us, not for us, but for your glory, God, not for us. In other words, not just for the individual ego, but for the good of the group and for the higher ideal. But the, the, the battle um, cry in one of them was seize the day. And that means don't wait till tomorrow. Don't procrastinate. If there is something that in your own life that you're just sort of thinking about, you've, got, you've thought it over and you, you thought I should do that or change, change my life or do something, Frankly, the way to really remember the night somewhere <laughs> is to just, you know, go for it. Go ahead and do it and just and, and have and the go for it. Not for your own yep. personal <laughs> ambition or growth, but for the glory of God. That's a that's an incredible right, motto. Right, right. And, and they were very much about that concept of martyrdom. Of course, the Red Cross, um, that's what got me off on the Red Cross thing. But they didn't actually wear the Red Cross until 1147. So the first Did the night, Templars believe in reincarnation? Um, no, not that we know of. No, no, they were okay. actually quite orthodox on the face of it, right? Mm-hmm. The, the rule is very orthodox, very straightforward. Um, again, we we only have the, the the main French translation. We we don't actually have the Latin original, but we have translations. Um, but again, there are perhaps others you know, out there that we hope would surface that would shed more light. But no, yeah, least, they did not believe in reincarnation. The reason I ask, Karen, is there are so many individuals, it seems, these days parading themselves around as reincarnated Templars, neo Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> is, is this yeah, harmless like, or dangerous? Well, it's, um, it's not really for me to answer. I, I don't know that, but I, mm-hmm. it depends on that individual's situation. But and it seems I think to the me basic... If... It, it seems to me if I the, think Templars the Templars were reinvented today, they'd be considered a terrorist organization. Well, also, yes, I think they? that again, it gets back to the issue of memory, the memory mm-hmm. of their of their, not only their history, the straightforward history that you know, the archives, the documented evidence, that type of thing, but it's their mythic history. Their their it's like a legendary memory that since the last burning of the Grand Master Jacques de Molay in 1314, the dramatic burning, which is very fascinating to read about in my book. I'm, you know, and other books, too, but it's really fascinating. And um, the various symbolism that was going on around that time they used. And, but from that point onwards, the Templars have always had a special, you know, mythos, in, especially in all of Western civilization, for sure. But today, it seems like, especially since the, the Da Vinci Code, um, treasure, national treasure, these films and everything, there is more interest um, in this kind of um, Western mystery tradition and the underlying, the underground stream of knowledge, some believe they call it that, from the um, perennial tradition, the ancient past coming through. The, um, but again, you know, that is all open to interpretation, um, which is another subject. But as far as the history, historic Knights Templar order, they were Orthodox Christians because they were never actually accused of being Gnostic, even though... They, they, there was an Abraxas image found on one of their seals in Paris and also here in England and other questions. But that doesn't mean the whole order were not, but it, they were using it as a protective um, carved gemstone, at the, which yeah, is very you know, common in medieval times. But, right, and it's but, you know, I that think, yes, a lot of people do, do say that they feel they're, you know, reincarnated Templar and that kind of thing now. But, again, it's our modern – it says more about us. It says more about us now in the 21st century, doesn't it? That we well, it's sort of like the whole Nazi connection with Atlantis, that it's as yeah, if we had wonder, to relive yeah, Atlantis in order to transcend yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People – well, they, it's not just the Templars. I mean, it's the Cathars. Well, some people believe that. There's all kinds of um, um, ways that this, this whole um, – what I see as a cultural hunger for meaning – People, you know, people, they go to the store, there's a barcode on their food, but, you know, they, they people just think, my God, I'm a number. I, you know, I, I've heard people say this after talks, questions and answers, that people say, oh, this is, you know, we've got to go back to this, you know, earlier time. But, you know, we can get meaning from our life now. It's just that we don't have to, just, to my complaint is we don't have to alter or change the facts of medieval history to do that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? 
Yes. Um, we, we can have creativity and imagination in our life now without having to actually alter the real history. And um, the Templars obviously must have had a very powerful hold, and they did. We know in the Middle Ages there were rumors even then of these incredible knights. They never lost a battle. Or, you know, they won this, they won that, and they come back with they some. There were rumors and whispers, and maybe they had the ark, and maybe they, you know, their rumors were then, and they are there now, you know. So, well, some of it's disinformation, again, but others of it has to have a, a kernel of truth. I'm particularly interested in their in their Baphomet symbol and the accusation leveled against them that they had a that they worshipped a strange head named Baphomet that could perform yes, miracles from a wasteland um, into a garden. The, the, again, the actual trial record, the transcript records reveal um, no one single definition because there were so many different details given that it's murky, very, very murky. But what, what I find so interesting is that the biblical scholar Hugh Schoenfeld had written a mm -hmm. book um, some years ago, and he had dissected this using the Atbash cipher, which is a very special mm -hmm. biblical cipher, and right. the Templars, obviously, um, in other areas, I'm not going to get into which documents, but they knew that cipher. And basically, the name Baphomet translated into Father of Wisdom. And uh, another possible translation or meaning is Baptism of Wisdom. So in a sense, it was a wisdom phenomenon. And, of course, um, the, the actual – what I find so interesting is we do have records from the, the Templars' own rule and their own records of what they themselves – what relics they did have, but it's it's amazing how people all they want to know about is, is the, the ark or the grail that, that we don't have proof. But when I say we have evidence of, of relics, the people are very surprised that there even are there is evidence. But we do know that they had the true cross. They believe that they had this, the possession of the true cross. It's in their rule, section 122 to be specific, and it says there that the, the rule says that if you have to take this relic and transport it by horse. Of course, if you can imagine what it was like in the Holy Land, they, it said, you know, very treacherous and dangerous. It, but they it said you had to have ten special knights only for the purpose of guarding this true cross relic day and night. That wow. at all times, this, guard, this relic should be carefully watched at every moment. So they really believed that they had that relic. And they, they said they had the crown of thorns. They had another um, cross relic at Acre that was believed to heal people. Uh, many, many came from far and wide to the Templars Church to be healed by this relic. And they had several heads of female martyr saints and all these things. And in Spain in particular, it's kind of interesting in the southern area, they had a very interesting cross relic called the Cross of Caravaca. So, I mean, there were some other relics out there that were more localized. And, again, this is not, um, you know, buried treasure, <laughs> but it, it is, to them, it was their, their prized possession. And, of exactly. course, a lot of the relics that were Templar were turned over to the hospitalers. So, yeah. again, some of those are not, you know, currently available as Templar relics, but they would be available in certain hospital archives. Mm -hmm. Karen, when we get back from the break, I want to talk for a moment about the Templars and, and Mary as well as Mary Magdalene. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Dr. Karen Rawls. Karen, Especially since the advent of the Da Vinci Code, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, many of these other books, there's been this linkage now suddenly between the Templars and Mary Magdalene. What are your thoughts on that connection? I think it's very fascinating. Um, I think everyone is intrigued by it. But, of course, as a historian, I can, I can tell you that we don't have actual documented evidence that the Templars ever believed, um, for example, that Jesus was married. Um, but again, like I said, a lot of archives have been destroyed. But we do, what we do know about the, the situation regarding St. Mary Magdalene and the, the Order of the Temple is from their rule, it's very straightforward. They list that, that Mary Magdalene's feast day, the 22nd of July, is definitely to be venerated. And, of course, that, that's not quite the same as worship, but it does mean venerate, which is very special. And the Templars, like all other devout Christians in the Middle Ages, um, did very strongly and highly venerate St. Mary Magdalene. She was very, very special to them. But again, that does not translate into, um, you know, taking it one or two steps further. At least we don't, we just don't have the ev concrete evidence for that. Um, but again, um, there were a number of issues around um, the Blessed Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene that 
you know, I might want to just briefly mention. One of them is that the order of the, the Knights Templar order itself was dedicated to the Blessed Mary, the Blessed Virgin. So um, that would be the Mother of God, um, Mother Mary, <laughs> Blessed Virgin. And um, we know that also not only from um, the, the, the promises or vows that the novices had to make, but also from the land deeds, the donations, because they, the land was specifically donated to the, 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 the patroness of the order, which is the Blessed St. Mary, so um, Blessed Virgin Mary. So we know that it was the Mother Mary, but um, St. Mary Magdalene was definitely venerated in the, on her feast day, and as were the other female martyrs. And so, again, if they didn't really single her out in a special sense, um, but that's what you're, you're asking. Um, no, but I just, find it, was... I just find it so intriguing that during this time period, you have the Cathars suddenly emerging mm-hmm. with an incredible yeah. wisdom tradition, one that was persecuted, and their veneration of Mary Magdalene, and suddenly in French legend, Mary Magdalene takes on the title the Illuminator during this time, the Illuminatrix, mm-hmm. as if she was a great initiate, a master. And mm-hmm. it, it, these trends happen concurrently, and they at the same, are persecuted concurrently as well. It's as if there's this brief shining moment in France at this time that seems to have mm-hmm. been sparked by whatever was discovered at the Temple of Solomon, and then suddenly, poof, it vanishes at the, at the boot of a force, a, a Catholic Church and a French Pope. How does how, I, talk about that moment just for a moment and what it what it actually means to us today? Well, I think that there was so much, as you say, there was like a crest of a wave or a peak, a cultural flowering, you might say, in some senses. But yet, mm-hmm. at the same time, that admittedly it was a very feudal time, very mm-hmm. hierarchical structure. Now, you know, it was very rigid in, in in our our modern way of thinking. We think, oh my goodness, you know, we wouldn't want to live on a you know, as a serf, I mean, you know, slaving away in the Middle Ages. But in a sense, <laughs> you know, the stereotype image. But um, actually, there was a lot going on, as you say. The Cathars, interestingly, were um, definitely persecuted, as we know, and was absolutely ruthless. And the Dominican Order was founded for the purpose of exterminating the Albigensian heresy, which was, mm-hmm. of course, in the Languedoc area. That was the Cathars. And um, that was first. The Templars came later. That was um, later on. But um, there were also at this time, many of the Gothic cathedrals were built. There was the, the Arthurian Grail manuscripts were written. Um, I might also add, and this is, this is important, but the very strong, powerful movement of pilgrimage. All, all together, I mean, everyone wanted to go to Jerusalem or Rome or Canterbury, places like this. Not only was it a requirement by the church to, be a, to go do that, but um, there were also an inordinately high number of pilgrims to the shrines of Mary, Blessed Mar- our, our Mother Mary, and the Black Madonnas. Mm-hmm. And um, we, you know, we might know we're running out of time, but that's a very fascinating subject of which I'm doing a lot more research on now with, uh, at the moment. Um, there's other places um, in, in Europe also that have Black Madonna statues. And again, it's, it's a very powerful thing. And we see a lot of that clustering in the Languedoc area as, and northern France, southern, um, northern Spain as well, that area around the Pyrenees. It's very special. But again, very early on, there was a, an early black goddess tradition, a pagan tradition that was there long before Christianity. So again, a lot of these um, themes are localized folklore that made its way into saint stories also. Karen, some of it. And people it's very frequently ask a lot me. of it. People frequently ask me if the Templars went to Egypt. Did the Templars do any research or excavating in Egypt? Because when you go that to we, certain temples we don't in Egypt, know the answer. that we don't we don't have any evidence for. Um, uh, there's, we just don't have enough information to say we really don't. I wish mm-hmm. we knew more. <laughs> yeah, and the, the only thing I search is on. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I point to is that when you're at like the Temple of Isis, the Black Virgin, you do see Templar seals. Etched onto the wall. Um, yes, those are Coptic church seals. I know exactly which ones you mean. I've been to Egypt, and okay. those are, um, of course, you know. One point I just want to make about the when you say cross, we we are of course talking about the four equal armed cross, which was mm-hmm. the Templars' main one of the main symbols. It's not the same as the modern day Christian cross, which is called the Latin cross, which mm-hmm. is you know when the middle um, pole is much longer than the crossbar. 
But the Templars and, of course, the early Celtic Church and others had this four equal armed cross, which the Coptic Church had as well. So what a lot of what happened at some of the ancient Egyptian temples is the Coptic Church came to those sites and put their crosses on it to sort of Christian, not just make their, leave their stamp of, you know, um, <laughs> I don't want to say power over the site, but, you know, it was, it was a way of trying to, you know, make sure that the Christian mark was there in some of the sites. But, again, it depends on which area of Egypt you're talking about. But, again, again, the Christ, you know, I just want to say there's so many diverse symbols, that the, the symbols of the seals of the Knights Templar, and I go into a lot of that um, in this book and in future works, um, the symbols and the seals and things like that. But we, we have a number of different um, local symbols that were used. And like you said, in the area of southern France, it's fascinating because the main symbol that the localized master of the temple used was not a severed head, it wasn't a lamb of God, it wasn't two knights on a horse, but it was, in fact, the dome of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So, again, <laughs> it's a Holy Land motif that was used in that area. But, again, it just depended on the area, the regional area. The Templars should really be studied regionally. You know, you really do get far more out of it doing a regionalized study, I've found. It really does shed a lot of light. But, again, we, we've lost the central archive, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, yes, as you're right, you know, there's so much more to explore. And, of course, for our lives today, again, like you said, seize the day is so key. Um, we have to seize the moment. And I think collectively, where are we? Where are we as a planet? You know, what about our planet, our country? You know, it's, it's beyond just ourselves. And I think that is one big powerful message of the medieval Templars. You really read their rule and study how they lived. Their main, one of their main ideas beyond just martyrdom on the battlefield or making money and, and prospering, <laughs> doing well in that sense, is to, to try to get beyond just yourself and look around you, be aware of the people around you and the society around you. And I would add the, the trees and the plants. And You know, we have, to, we have to realize we, each of us, have a role to play in the entire big drama. And in that sense, we all should seize the day and do our part and try to figure out how, what can we leave behind to make, it, make our contribution worth it. And I think if there's anything that we can take with us from the medieval Templars, it is the seize the day idea, you know, in a way we can, each of us can do that in our own way. Mm-hmm. You can really, you know, in medieval space, go for it. <laughs> you know, um, I think, you know, we are, we are at a real interesting time in the early 21st century. And I think we, we all, you know, we have to realize, we have to just stop accepting things just, you know, without really questioning. And we have to all keep probing and keep moving and keep growing. You right. Know? That's Karen, our job. <laughs> in the few minutes we have right. left, I wanted to uh, point our listeners to another of your really incredible books and subject matters, Music in the Celtic Underworld, or Celtic Otherworld, excuse me. I uh, had a fun conversation with my new neighbor the other day. She's a, she's a country music superstar in Australia who's been in Nashville, where I live here for a few years, and she's uh, oh. an up-and-comer and... She mentioned that she's really into Irish music, and I said, "Well, you know, that's where country oh, music right. comes from. Mm. That when they the the devotees of William and of, of William of Orange, when they were run out of Ireland, they came and founded Tennessee. Mm-hmm. The Scotch Irish founded Tennessee, and they brought their oh, music yeah. with them. And uh, people started calling <laughs> yeah. them the the Billies of the Hills, the devotees of William, oh, yes. the Billies They're of the Hills, and their and their music is called the Hillbilly music, and what I told her, which <laughs> left her just wide-eyed, was that this the fiddle music, the fiddle music that became country music, originated with people trying to tune into and listen to the, the music of the other realms, even of the, the mm-hmm. fairy realm. And it just mm-hmm. brought this, like, magical awakening uh, to her. You could just see her light up. So talk for that, just about that, just for a moment, about your research well, that, that's, supernatural that's, music. Obviously, it's an entirely separate subject, but it is right. it, it fits into the early old. Well, we had to learn the old Irish language and the Scottish Gaelic language um, at the University of Edinburgh. And in doing that, I kept noticing references to various um, the, the two at the day to non and the shining ones and all of these beings. But as a musician, <laughs> I play the harp and the flute myself. I was rather amused when um, you know those those instruments were not only thought to be very powerful in the in the fairy sense, but also a bit dangerous. 
Um, and, you know, you, you know, you're supposed to be careful about the strains of the fairy harp and that type of thing. And again, I just kept, um, I've got a massive um, database I've been keeping of all of the references um, to that in, you know, the, to the Celtic languages and about this music. And yes, it is very interesting because it's, it's a world, part of a worldwide phenomenon of early folklore and tales about the power of music to transport the listener into another realm of perhaps um, usually peaceful or, you know, um, happy, joyful. And there's, there's, in the Irish story, there's three strings. There's the joyful strain, there's the melancholy strain, and then there's the special sleep strain, which was, um, of course, St. Patrick had to be very careful. He was warned. <laughs> be careful not to wow. preach too much over there because, of the, you know, there was this, supposedly this fairy musician with a special harp named Kaskorach, and he was his harp was especially dangerous to listen to because he would definitely have known to put the clergyman to sleep. And it's a sort of it's a metaphorical tale of the spiritual struggle of the conversion of Ireland. But it's very fascinating about the role of music in this, this otherworldly sense um, it's in many folklore stories, and Native Americans have it, Australian Dreamtime. You know, we see it all over the world. But, um, yes, it is very fascinating. The Irish and the Scots in particular have many folk tales about this. And then, lo and behold, here's this recent announcement about this father and son team that have found this piece of music in the carvings at Roslyn. Mm-hmm. Intentionally right. put there as a guide to put us into a trance. Well, there, to put there's us into... been many, many people through the years have made claims about what what the cubes mean and what you know how they might be um, translated or put together or taken apart. <laughs> as far as the research, and of course, a lot of the, the imagery. Some people believe it's Pythagorean. Other people disagree with that. And and they're they're the latest in a in quite a long. I mean, I remember years ago hearing things like this. So I, I haven't actually seen their findings, and I don't comment on anyone's writing or findings without actually reading them first. And I haven't met the, the gentleman in question. But, mm-hmm. um, again, there are so many theories about everything in Roslyn. <laughs> and I right. think that's probably one of the special things about it. It does stimulate a lot of exciting debate. Absolutely. Whether or not it's a supernatural music box or not, it's still <laughs> an incredibly yeah. enchanting and magical place. And on that note, Thank you so much, Karen, for taking the time to talk with us. I, again, I've looked well, forward to talking you to too, you for William. a long it's time. It's great to be on Dreamland. It's really great, and I, I wish all of your listeners a, to you know a good a good future and seize the day. <laughs> seize the <laughs> day. Seize the day. Get over to KarenRawls.com and look at some of the incredible articles she's got in her books. And thank you so much, Karen. We'll look forward to talking with you again. All the best, William. Thank you. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. In the past three years, the price of a ton of rice has gone from $250 to $750, and then just in the past couple of months to $850. People are frantic. Today, Linda has news updates about seed shortages, biofuel backfires, and the rapid increase in hunger in 37 poor countries. What does this mean? Well, Emmy Award winner Linda Moulton Howe, EarthFiles.com's brilliant webmaster, has got a little bit to tell us about this. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thank you, Whitley. In February, I received a phone call from a North Dakota farmer who I had talked to before on other farm issues. He said that he and his wheat farmer colleagues were having a hard time finding Durham wheat seed to plant for a crop later this year. He wondered why there was such a short supply for the big demand, given the fact that the price of wheat had risen from $4 a bushel in 2007 to around $25 a bushel this spring of 2008. That's a six times increase. The U.S. Department of Agriculture confirms that global wheat stocks are at their lowest level in 30 years, while U.S. wheat stocks are the lowest that they have been in 60 years. Hard red spring wheat is scarcest of all, as the price of wheat has skyrocketed and supply and demand have caused the commodity markets to buy up a lot of wheat as well. I began reading about the East Coast bakeries facing huge increases this year 
in the prices that they have to pay for flour. And, of course, those prices are being passed on to you, me, and other consumers. Then came the headlines around the world in which the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and UN's Food and Agriculture Organization were warning that mounting food prices in 37 poorer countries was going to provoke more violent riots, riots, as already has happened in Haiti, Egypt, and the Philippines. What happened between last year and this year to cause wheat, soy, rice, and other seed shortages, at least in local American spots, and what has provoked grain food shortages and rapidly rising food prices in the United States and internationally? I took that question to Colin Carter, Ph.D., Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of California in Davis. Professor Carter received his Ph.D. in Agricultural Economics from the University of California in Berkeley in 1980, and he has spoken before congressional committees on agricultural economy issues. A year ago, in the May 17, 2007 issue, of the Los Angeles Times, he co-authored an opinion piece entitled, quote, Why Ethanol Backfires, unquote. And the article begins, policymakers and legislators often fail to consider the law of unintended consequences. The latest example is their attempt to reduce the United States' dependence on imported oil by shifting a big share of the nation's largest crop, corn to the production of ethanol for fueling automobiles. President George Bush has set a target of replacing 15% of domestic gasoline use with biofuels, including ethanol and biodiesel, over the next 10 years, which would require almost a five-fold increase in mandatory biofuel use to about 35 billion gallons. With current technology, almost all of this biofuel would have to come from corn because there is no feasible alternative. However, achieving the 15% goal would require the entire current U.S. corn crop, which represents a whopping 40% of the world's corn supply. This would do more than create mere market distortions the irresistible pressure to to divert corn from food to fuel would create unprecedented turmoil. Thus, in the absence of cost-effective, domestically available sources for producing ethanol rather than using corn, it would make far more sense to import ethanol from Brazil and other countries that can produce it efficiently. And now, I asked Professor Carter, if it is now my understanding from his point of view that it is this ethanol policy in the U.S. that may be at the heart or behind the dominoes falling and creating grain seed shortages, high food prices, and growing international food crisis in poor countries. In short, why is ethanol backfiring? One bushel of corn gives you approximately 2.8 gallons of ethanol. So it would take virtually the entire corn crop to produce that much ethanol. 35 billion gallons. Right. You take 10 billion bushels of corn times, call it three instead of 2.8, that's 30 billion. So there's your corn crop right there. And there's a lot of talk about using other material for ethanol, such as switchgrass. And that's great. And there's a lot of research going on in that area. And it would be wonderful if we found a material that virtually costless. But the technology isn't there. The infrastructure is not there. It's true you can produce ethanol from switchgrass, but we don't have a mechanism for collecting it and transporting it, and what are the economics of that? You know, as we say in the article, producing ethanol from sugar is much more efficient than from corn because corn, you have to turn it into sugar first. So producing it from sugarcane is a heck of a lot more efficient. That's what Brazil is good at. We keep that product out with a tariff. So why did this administration focus on corn? Uh, Corn farmers. (laughs) ADM. Who do you suppose benefits from this policy? It's company 
companies like ADM who have ethanol plants and the corn producers. Now we have a problem, and a lot of the farmers have invested money into uh, building ethanol plants in their communities. And have you read about all the problems associated with those? No, explain. Oh, it's a mess. If you look at the website, Renewable Fuels Association, that has a lot of information on this. And the number of plants has just exploded. And unfortunately, a lot of those are owned by farmers. So if we reverse the policy, we've got a problem where all these plants will go broke. But now the communities are pushing back because the plants use a lot of water. They're polluting the local environment. In any case, those who benefit from the higher price of corn or those who benefit from subsidized ethanol are pushing this policy. Look at the website of the National Corn Growers Association. And the mess is that where farmers have tried to buy the equipment and set up an ethanol-producing business, that they end up polluting the water, the soil, and causing environmental problems wherever they are. Yes. In terms of polluting the water, an ethanol plant uses a lot of water, so they're drawing down water tables. These plants have popped up all over. So it is an impossible administration goal, correct? Well, it's a ridiculous goal. People will say, oh, by then we'll have all this other technology up and running. And, well, maybe, but we've been working on that for a long time, too. And meanwhile, look what's happening to the price of corn. And if we kept pushing for a 15% domestic gasoline replacement by biofuels, then we would continue to be hurting the entire international supply and demand in grains and corn. Yeah. Absolutely, in terms of uh, poor consumers of the world. Let's import it from Brazil. And why not? Well, why not? Good question. It's the National Corn Growers Association, Linda. Look at their website. They don't want to reduce the tariff. You reduce the tariff, all these plants will go out of business. I grew up on a farm. If I was a corn farmer in Iowa, I'd be real happy right now. I mean... It's American politics, right? You've read about lobby groups and how Congress really works. There's no turnover in Congress. Re-election depends on getting money. And how do you get money? You give people favors. But this is the first time that a government policy has said we're going to set a goal of replacing 15% of domestic gasoline use with biofuels, which includes ethanol and biodiesel. And this means then that the United States is making a first change in how it is growing its food and that it is now having a domino effect on the entire international grain and corn market. Yeah, no question. We made a decision to move a massive amount of our farmland into the production of fuel. And people were told this will reduce our dependence on foreign oil it will help reduce greenhouse gases and so on and so forth. All these points you really have to question. And that's why you wrote one year ago, Why Ethanol Backfires. That's right. And can you now explain your perspective a year later on how ethanol continues to backfire and what you see is coming in the future? Well, I hate to say it, but I think we were right, and certainly the past year has demonstrated that we were right when we wrote that article. It continues to backfire because the U.S. government has increased the goal for biofuels by a huge factor this past December. Have they increased 15% replacement? Yeah, I believe it's higher. There was legislation passed in December 07. Well, that would mean that this current Bush administration then is committing all of the corn acreage of the United States to producing gasoline over the next decade. Well, they won't admit that. They'll say, no, 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 no. And I believe in the legislation, Linda, there's a limit on how much can come from corn, but it's high. But from your point of view, we're essentially on a disastrous policy path. Well, it's an absurd policy, not unlike a lot of other policies that we observe in Washington. What could we do that might return the United States to a more logical and sensible path that was not hurting the rest of the world's grain and corn markets? The first thing is drop the import tariff on ethanol from Brazil. Allow our industry to compete. The second, eliminate the subsidy for blending. 
There's another 50 cent a gallon subsidy. If ethanol is a great idea, it should not have to be subsidized. And that subsidy for blending, could you explain that a little more? Yeah. As you know, when you go to the gas pump nowadays, most of the fuel you put in your car is blended, right? It's got maybe 5% ethanol or something. And there's a tax credit that oil companies receive when they blend ethanol with gasoline. And I believe it's 52 cents a gallon or something like that. That is reinforcing the shift over to ethanol and the use of corn acreage for creating ethanol. That's right. I mean, it's all part and parcel, right? We have a mandated uh, quantity of ethanol that must be used in the country. And for this year, it's 9 billion gallons, 9 billion. So that's 3 billion bushels of corn, 25 to 30% of the corn crop. And the government wants at least another 35 billion gallons in 10 years, which would take the entire corn acreage crop. If it came from corn. But, you know, presumably in 10 years' time, we'll be using other feedstocks. Well, right now, from April of 2008 going forward, what do you think the worst case is in a year or 15 months from now? Uh, worst case, we have a, a major drought in uh, the Corn Belt and acres yields suffer, 15%. That's worst case. And what would happen? Uh, well, I think we pointed out in the LA Times piece, prices would go through the roof if there was a major drought or, you know, some other catastrophe. Last year we had good weather. The year before we had good weather. We've been lucky. But Australia and the Ukraine have suffered drought and floods, and they were both very large contributors in the wheat market, and they are way down. Yeah, they are. Yeah, that's true. So we do have weather effects that are already affecting the global grain trade. And in the United States, if we stay on this path of ethanol, which you have described as backfiring, what is the worst case if we do not shift on this policy of trying to reach 35 billion gallons of biofuel replacement of our gasoline in 10 years? Well, people start to starve to death. How many deaths will it take before we admit that ethanol policy has backfired? How many people have to starve to death in Africa? Okay, that's worst case. How long do you think, knowing politics and the political world, how long could we go on with the current goal that this administration has set for ethanol? I don't know, Linda. If prices continue to rise sharply, I would hope there'd be some pressure put on the politicians to reverse it, but I really don't know. On Monday, April 14, 2008, President George Bush ordered Secretary of Agriculture Ed Schaefer to draw down an estimated $200 million from a reserve known as the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust as emergency aid to go to where the World Bank says that people are suffering now the very most. There are 37 countries uh, to try to prevent more violence and death in Haiti, Egypt, and the Philippines. They are currently at the top of the priority list internationally, as well as countries in Africa. But even farmers in the United States are rebelling against something that has been in place for such a very long time and seems such a stable part of American agriculture, and that is the conservation program of being paid subsidies not to plant in certain lands and to let them be used for birds and for environment. The New York Times reported on April 9th, quote, thousands of farmers are taking their fields out of the government's biggest conservation program which pays them not to cultivate. They are spurning guaranteed annual payments for a chance to cash in on the boom in wheat, soybeans, corn, and other crops. Last fall, 2007, they took back as many acres as are in Rhode Island and Delaware combined. The group that is doing this to undermine the amiable coexistence is the farmers themselves. Last fall in 2007, when 5 million acres in Conservation Reserve came up for renewal, only half of them were reentered. 
While this program has gained some high priority land in the last few months, in part from an initiative to restore bobwhite quail habitats, the net loss is still more than 2 million acres, and birds, plants, and animals are now threatened. And here is a quote. If the government lets the land out and then crop prices fall, that's going to hurt a lot of farmers, said Mr. Shuring, who is a farmer in Andover, South Dakota. If it does not let the land out and prices keep going up, that will hurt a lot of consumers. Oh, if only we had a crystal ball, unquote, a farmer in the Dakotas. And Whitley, the complexity of this current situation and where we might be a year from now, every single person that I have talked to, ranging from conservation seed, agriculture, seed certification, uh, and to Professor Carter, is that they, they call this a time of huge turmoil, and they do not know where we will be in a year from now. Linda, in 1985, I published a book called Nature's End, which foresaw an enormous drought in the Midwestern United States, and that now hangs over the country and the world, literally, like a sword of Damocles. He said it. Right. We've been lucky so far. That's right. Rice prices that I referred to earlier have gone skyrocketing through the roof. People are starving all over Asia because of the drought that hit Australia now. And the Ukraine. And the Ukraine. That's right. I'm sorry. It, it This, it, you know, the people that say it's too costly to do anything about global warming, one month of the increased food prices that has been, have been experienced so far would have paid for all of the research that has ever been done into this subject by mankind over the past 10 years. And remember the scientist that I have interviewed so many times on Dreamland who said, as the future progresses, what happens with the weather and the impact on food crops could mean that we get to a time of such turmoil that people will turn to violence in countries where they cannot get food, and it is already happening. In Haiti, right now, and in Thailand, right now. And it will keep happening, and it's going to happen in the Philippines. It already almost has in the Philippines, because when people can't eat, when they can't get food, they get absolutely frantic. And it listen, it can happen here. Linda, we have come to the end of our time together, but it was a powerful and sobering report. Folks, next week, Francine King of the Monroe Institute. Francine King has been with the Monroe Institute for a long time. In fact, she was the leader of the gateway I took immediately after I had finished communion and before it had been published. It was my first gateway, so far my only one, and also Francine's first gateway. She is an absolute past master of the work of the Monroe Institute, and I can tell you from experience, from the very beginning, she was quite extraordinary. Next week for our subscribers and on Dreamland, Francine King. And then the week after, live for our subscribers. You mean the primary power behind these templates? Mm -hmm. Well... I don't think they had only one particular aspect of power. I mean, it depends on how you define power. That would be my first question there. Um, mm -hmm. But assuming that you mean, like, earthly power or wealth or mm -hmm. land, of course, yes, the Templars were, in, in very a very real sense, the first um, concept in our Western civilization and history, and Europe especially, of a, of a type of multinational corporation. They were, in a sense, the first medieval example of that, um, they had their headquarters in the, in the east, in the Holy Land, and then they had many, many um, localized regional areas in, in England, Portugal, Spain, France, all the way to Eastern Europe even. And those, those sections were called commanderies. And that was, of course, they had a, a, master, a local master of the Templars in charge of that area, kind of in our, our conception would perhaps would be the governor of the state, <laughs> as opposed to the president of the nation, you know, that, that kind of a structure. And they had a real hierarchical structure, of course, as did most of the, you know, religious orders. Um, but the Templars were not just an ordinary religious order in terms of 
when you say monk, um, you think of a, a praying monk in a monastery. Um, of course, the Templars were very devout, but, but the found, one of the key founders and sponsors was a very powerful, influential Cistercian abbot by the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. Mm-hmm. And this, this whole area that he was from is in what we call Champagne area today of France. And um, at that time, it was called Old Burgundy, where Burgundy wine comes from. <laughs> and um, there's the city of Troy, which is very key in, in, in a sense in the early Templars. Um, the first nine knights, um, the legendary nine knights who went to um, the Holy Land initially in the early 12th century, were from uh, this area of Troy. So in a sense, all roads lead to Troy um, <laughs> in the many different ways. <laughs> um, if you really want to start dissecting the beginnings of the order, which in my opinion are far more enigmatic than the end. Um, that's the side con of mine. But I, I do think that, um, that as far as power, um, many questions remain about, of course, people say, what did the Templars find? What were they digging for? Were they digging? Um, of course, um, as a scholar... This is William Henry filling in for Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. Welcome, everyone. It's been described as... Bedlam in Scotland, with the advent of the Da Vinci Code, Muslim Chapel near Edinburgh has suddenly been thrust into the, into the global limelight. Many are excited about the possibility that secret artifacts of the mysterious Knights Templar hidden in the crypt under Roslyn Chapel may soon be revealed. The media brainwashing machine put Roslyn through another spin cycle again recently when a father and son team claimed to have unraveled the coded piece of music hidden in the carvings of the temple. As always, there is far, far more to Rosalind Chapel and Templar mysteries, we believe. Perhaps claims like these only serve to cloud the real issues and the real secrets of the Templars. And in order to get to the core of the mysteries of the Templars, it's important to have a rock-solid foundation of knowledge upon which to climb. Our guest today, Dr. Karen Rawls, is an Oxford-based author, medieval historian, and religious studies scholar. She's widely recognized for her work on that rock-solid Templar foundation. The stones of this foundation we know are very heavy to lift, and Karen's been doing some very heavy lifting. She obtained her Ph.D. from the University of Edinburgh and was postdoctoral fellow at Edinburgh University before continuing with specialist medieval research in Oxford. Dr. Rawls is a member of the British Association for the Study of Religion, the American Academy of Religion, the Oxford University Religious Studies Society, and is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Many listeners have likely seen Karen on numerous TV documentaries for the History Channel, Discovery, and National Geographic Agency, excuse me, the National Geographic Channel. Her website is KarenRawls.com. She is here to talk about her new book, The Knights Templar Encyclopedia. Karen, welcome to Dreamland. Well, thank you, William. Very nice and honored to be on the program. And, well, of course, your listeners are often very attuned to many of these things already, so it should be a very interesting hour. Absolutely, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. You and I have corresponded for years. It's nice to finally hear your voice. <laughs> and yours, too, yes. So, first question, Karen, how does an American girl, an American woman, find herself at Oxford <laughs> and at Roslyn, with a, with a uh, front row seat to one of the greatest mysteries of perhaps the last couple thousand years or so. Well, every every one of us, of course, ambassador from the United States, living in Britain or the UK, but you're also an ambassador from the wild side, if you will. You're a wild child who's also got a PhD <laughs> and has to uh, operate as a help. historian <laughs> and someone with an open mind, which is so rare among, it seems, among scholars. Talk about how you built that bridge well, for a moment. Well, it is, it is very interesting. It, uh, I, I would have to say the overall climate in that sense in academia is much better now than it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. Things are changing. Um, on the other hand, in the alternative community, there are some some who you know, don't have as open of a mind as what one might originally think. So, I mean, mm-hmm. there are many different factions and groups within both areas. Um, it is interesting to go between the two. <laughs> it, can get, <laughs> it can get a bit of a, a tight wire act, as they say. Um, it can be difficult sometimes, you know. But um, by and large, I would say, um, given the Internet and the digitalization of so many archives now and libraries, you can find so much more online that everyone can, can do research and ask questions and, and do their quest. And that includes academics. 
you know, no one is exempt from, from further learning and <laughs> exploration. So in a sense, we all um, can do that. And yes, of course, academics often do like to um, protect their turf, as it were. But um, I think, in, especially in medieval history, um, there are so many dimensions to each area of study that um, there's no way that one could ever have a handle on any one given part. And one of the biggest medieval Congress conferences of all in academia is in America. It's in Michigan every year, so I think that's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it, it's like it's very fascinating. I mean, you can you can study this anywhere, but um, I, I'm sort of a hands-on person. I actually like to go to the sites. But um, again, I I think a lot of it is about, you know, it's not just about you know studying words on paper or in dusty archives or libraries, you know, and and of course many you know, older locations, the carvings, it, it all sounds very fascinating. But the truth is we are now, even in photography and things like that, with the increased technology and digitalization, there are now more information and details emerging about some of these subjects, and in particular, tonight's Templar. So mm -hmm. I think, in a, as you know, is on a quest. And I think, uh, again, so much of what um, your introduction talked about um, the subject of the mysteries and quests and relics and things like that. Um, ironically, in my own case, I was just very interested in not only doing some family research involving ancestors in the British Isles, but also mm. in medieval history. So naturally, I think at some point for me, I wanted to actually go to the sites and the archives, which originally were here, and I um, wasn't you know, sure how long I would stay on, but the more I got into it and the more depth that, you know, the research revealed many more years later, <laughs> and I'm wow. still here. But um, I, I am, in a sense, um, an ambassador both ways. I mean, it's, it's been very fascinating to, to be here as an American as well. Um, yes, it has been. But again, a lot of these issues about the medieval period, um, of course, our country started um, in the 18th century, but a lot of the, the history, um, I know like some movies like National Treasure and things like that, people like to try to make a connection with the medieval time because there is something about the Middle Ages. It has, a, a, you know, it seems to have a mystical aura about it anyway. <laughs> and I think a lot of that is due to, as you said in your intro there, you know, Hollywood films and novels and things like The Da Vinci Code has actually been a very powerful phenomenon um, beyond, far beyond just a novel. And it has indeed started a whole new cycle of questioning for, for everyone. Um, even scholars <laughs> are finding themselves um, in a very interesting situation. So I think from all ends of the spectrum, all of us are on a quest. And as an academic, I have been on a quest as well. Um, it is, I, it, I ended up over here um, in Britain, but at the same time, um, I can go to the sites and the archives more easily here and then come back. To, I come to America several times a year. So mm -hmm. it is very fascinating, but there's so much to it. And the more you learn, the more you know there is yet to learn. Yeah, and well, one of the things I appreciate about your work so much, Karen, is it, when you look at the, the, the other books that you've published, on uh, whether it be on the supernatural aspects of Celtic music or the Holy Grail mm -hmm. and your quest mm -hmm. for the Celtic key, which I hope to talk with you about for a moment later, you have, you're not only an ambassador. The, the Templar research and information about them is really only getting off to a real good start in more recent years, partly and, because and, of more information. Mm -hmm. And one of the points that you make that I think is so important is that one reason we want to study the history of the Templars is not just because it takes us into such exciting domains as the study of the Gnostics or Solomon's Temple or or other esoteric type of subjects, but you also believe that studying the history of the Templars or, or history in general can help help us propel into the future. Talk about that aspect of your quest. Mm. Well, I think any any medieval historian would say, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the, the traditional topics that we think of when you say Middle Ages, most people think of King Arthur, the Grail, or, um, again, Indiana Jones searching for something. I mean, we have certain images, and one of those is of the Crusader Knight Templar with the, the white mantle with the red cross symbol, you know, the trademark images and, and, you know, I almost could say stereotypes in a sense that we have about these subjects. However, sometimes the nitty-gritty 
reality, and especially like in the case of a daily life of a Knight Templar, which was actually a lot different than sometimes what we're, you know, generally led to believe or think about, um, because a lot of Templars were not necessarily a full Knight of the Order. Now, maybe 10% were a smaller percentage, but, you know, by, by and large, three-quarters of the Order were not full Knight Templars, you know, the, the classic warrior image we have. They, were, mm. they did work in um, agricultural things, they did trade things, they did all kinds of business activities as well, and a lot of variety there. And so, again, now more details are emerging about the practical daily life of not just the Templars, but all these other subjects, some of the Grail romances now we're having more information about, you know, more of the Arthurian characters in those stories. So, again, a lot of, a lot of this is just now starting to come to the fore in a very vibrant way that it hasn't beforehand. So it is an exciting time. The Templars possessed and became sworn guardians of, quote-unquote, ancient knowledge. Do you think this alone accounts for the rise in Templarism, or is it something else that's driving this? It's the power pack behind this. 